Okay, thank you for coming out tonight and supporting the CHAP program. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about an event that occurred 100 years ago, or at least it was in, in progress 100 years ago in 1915. World War I ran between 1914 and 1918. The United States didn't get involved really until the last few months of the war, so we don't tend to remember it very much for that reason. Although there's a much greater sense of memory in Europe and in other parts of the world. And the purpose for tonight's presentation is to talk not just about World War I, but how World War I impacted the rest of the 20th and now 21st centuries. So there'll be a lot of effects. We'll talk only a little bit about what the causes of the war, and uh, not a whole lot about the war itself, uh, because of course that's easily studied. But in this case, why we remember something is really the question, and that I want you to think about why remember World War I, even if for the United States it was only a small involvement. But it had long-term ramifications that are still with us, and I wish they would go away, but they won't. So we'll see that as we go through the course of the, of the evening. And we promise to get you out of here as close to 8 o'clock as possible. So I uh, hopefully think some good questions, and when we get to that, we'll see where we are. So anyway, century of disaster, the dark legacy of the Great War. Well, one of the things that 100 years ago, at least in 1914, we had the European powers and not just European powers, but uh, also an, an Asian power, rushing to war. Why would countries that were the most advanced, the most powerful, the most successful uh, colony, uh, countries that had colonies all over the world, why would they go to war with each other? Uh, primarily because they were, as the, the great industrial powers of the day, they were powerful, they were competitors, they were, the, those that had gotten out there first, like the British actually controlled they had more territory than others had, and so new countries that had just industrialized and had just become unified, such as Germany, which was not even a unified country until 1871, and Japan, which started to modernize in 1867, these countries, as you'll see, and we'll come back, they'll obviously come back in World War II, um, they, they, they want their place in the sun, they want this. And so part of the reason why they're involved in all of these, these uh, activities that are related to this war is that as great powers, they are, they are out for themselves. They want to, get, they want to be, get the benefits of being a great power. And um, industrialization, by the way, is the key to great power status. Why is China such a powerful and brand new country today? Because they've only really industrialized in a large way in the last 50 years. So as industrialization spreads, power spreads around the world. And it's more, di it's more diver uh, diverse than it was 100 years ago. By 1900, for instance, the United States which was started its industrialization 50 years after Britain, had already passed Britain. And, it, and Germany was already the number two industrial power by 1900. So the British, who had been out there, the 500-pound gorilla first, they were now third. And the other countries were competitors. So, anyway. What we see here in 1900 is, is all of these countries that are cheek by jowl with each other, right next to each other, competing for their place in the sun. And but one of the interesting facts about the start of the war is that every country felt that it was going to a war for defensive purposes. We have to go to war because someone's going to attack us. And they, so the idea of preventative war, which we actually uh, are involved in to a certain extent today, is, is something that's a long history of that. And so World War I was every country felt they were the innocent victim. And so um, at the end of the war, this, of course, is going to you know, have long-term effects because of that. So here you see... This is obviously a German cartoon because the German uh, soldiers at the center of this and, and right to his lower um, right here is, is the ally, they're Austrians. Their, their ally, the Italians, by the way, switched sides during the war. So the, the Italians, they don't like the Italians. And then the, the Germans' big rival are the British. They have a naval arms race going on leading up to the war, building battleships. The British build a better battleship, the Germans build a better battleship. And they, they were going on and on, and they were building battleships for, for a, a, a war, a battle that never really took place. There was only one major battle during the war with battleships, and after that they became kind of uh, targets for planes in World War II. So, and then the French here. The French are the only ones who really wanted to go to war for a mean reason. They wanted revenge. They wanted to get territory back that the Germans had taken from them in the, the war in 1871. Alsace and Lorraine, which are in the center part of Europe. They would have been right here. And the other one that really wanted to go to war is Serbia, which is down here. And it became the, the basis for Yugoslavia, which is created after the war. And of course, Yugoslavia really doesn't exist now. 
one of the effects of the war. So, World War I, an industrial war by industrial powers with industrial ways to kill people. And that's one of the, this is a war of horrors. And in, in this war, we had killing on a, um, on a global scale, in a sense. And we see some of the new things here. We have uh, poison gas. Uh, poison gas, any of you have been in the military and you've had to go through poison gas training, the purpose of poison gas is basically to burn your lungs out and you drown in your own phlegm. So it's not a happy thing. But they, they were uh, using phosgene gas, they were using mustard gas, they were using chlorine gas, which would burn your eyes. One of the effects of so you might be blinded. One of the effects of this, by the way, was that Hitler was gassed during the war, and so he never used all the gas during World War II. He had it, but he didn't use it. Uh, here we have a plane that's actually dropping uh, uh, steel arrows on the soldiers there. So, yes, they were bombing, but they were also dropping all kinds of things on, on uh, students, or students, excuse me. <laughs> little, little bit blurred there. So, anyway, um, flamethrowers. Uh, machine guns and, of course, heavy artillery. This is an artillery war, and a lot of the people who survived the war, uh, like my students, are, are often shell-shocked from all of the, the hits that, that they were taking, and uh, what we now call war PTSD and, and battle fatigue in World War II, is this is the first war that they really recognized this. So um, there were many, many ways to kill, and, of course, the death total was beyond anything that had come before in terms of countries in Central Europe. Here's the, uh, basically the top 10 battles, or the, the top 10 terrible battles of World War I. And you can see that we're talking about the 100 days offensive near the end of the war, but 1.855 million casualties. Uh, even the one at the bottom, Tannenberg, is only 187,000. Think about the context for this. I mean, this is a war, basically when they went to war, nobody really had any good reason why they were fighting it. But they got into it and then they couldn't stop because they had to have victory. As all of the politicians who were the leaders in the war couldn't stop because what about all the people that have died? You, you, you're now stuck to, you have to win the war. And it just means more and more and more slaughter. Thank you. Um, some of the more famous battles, the Battle of the Somme here, the Battle of Verdun, the Verdun between the French and the Germans, almost a million casualties there. Passchendaele, which is a British, victory, British, British fight, as, as is the Somme for the most part. Gallipoli is the attack on on Istanbul by the uh, British and French, mainly using Australian troops and New Zealand troops for the most part. But anyway, all of these were horrible, horrible examples of man's ability to kill each other. Uh, I want to mention this. My grandfather was in World War I at, in the Italian army, and so I just wanted to say I wouldn't be here if he had happened to die in that war. And uh, so one of the things that all of us have is we have links back to many of these events and the events that will follow believe it or not. So the Italians are great um, lovers, but not good soldiers. So I speak being half Italian, I can get away with that. Um, now, the United States got into the war. Originally, the US stayed out of the war because we didn't have any real reason to be in the war. And, we, and quite frankly, we never had any real reason to be in the war, even when we entered it. Um, the United States was then in the uh, progressive era, in which the progressives were trying to solve all the problems of the world. And Wilson, standing off on the side, said, well, those darn Europeans would only just get clear their heads and they would be able to stop this war. And so he came up with what he calls his 14 points. And the French premier, Clemenceau, once said, you know, the Ten Commandments was good enough for God, but Wilson wants 14 points. <laughs> so uh, what we have here are mostly allied war aims, um, open diplomacy, which means no more secret treaties, freedom of the seas, which is what America was complaining about during the war, the British and then the, were stopping their ships, and then the Germans start uh, torpedoing them later on in the war. Uh, and so economic barriers, reductions of armaments, adjustment of colonial claims, uh, conquered territories in Russia. Russia was going out of the war by the time the United States started getting involved. Preservation of Belgium, restoration of that, for those two French provinces that were taken away, redrawing the Italian frontiers, that's to keep the Italians happy. They wanted Trieste, which is at the northern end of the Adriatic. It's part, it became part of Yugoslavia, which got them very angry after the war. Uh, division of Austria-Hungary. Now this is, the Austria-Hungarian Empire was an empire that had many minorities. And what Wilson was promising these minorities is that, well, for all the Slovaks, we'll have a Slovakia. And for all the Czechs, we'll have a Czech country. And for all the Serbs, we'll have a South Serb country. And, um, and for the Poles, we'll have a Poland. 
by saying, let's break up the empire and let peoples have their own countries. This is a promise that went beyond Europe and people all over the world look to Wilson to solve the problems of being like a, colon a colonized power so that they would ask for their own uh, countries in other parts of the world, especially Asia, which we'll see in just a minute. But all of these things here, essentially, the redrawing of the Balkan boundaries also did that. The only thing that the United States actually got out of the peace conference was the, uh, the Association of Nations, the League of Nations at the bottom of which the United States Senate promptly um, did not approve, and so we didn't get anything out of World War I. So it was kind of a waste for our people that were Americans. We had only uh, 58,000 battle deaths in the war, which is the same as Vietnam, by the way. But that was in three and a half months, not in 10 years. We also had more than that number who died of disease during the war as well. Throughout most of our wars until World War II, most Americans died of disease in the war rather than actual battle deaths. Of course, right in the middle of the war, at the very end of it, the influenza broke out. And this only happened and only became terrible because it impacted young men who had come from many different parts of their country and who were together in training camps. And it was people your age, I'm talking about the, the, early, the young 20s, those were the ones who were dying, not the old geezers like me. Because oftentimes the older people had actually been exposed to some variation of these diseases earlier on. They didn't realize it. And so it was young people that died. In the United States, 100,000 died in a week. 25 million in the world, just in the year 1918 alone. This is the Spanish flu. The word flu comes from the influenza. This is the worst um, plague since the Black Plague. And it still is worse than anything we've had recently. And it could come back, by the way. So get your flu shots. The war ended with an armistice. What is an armistice? Does anybody know? It's simply an agreement to stop fighting. There's no victor. There's no defeated. Um, the Wilson had offered the 14 points as a, a basis for peace. The Allies, when they saw that, we were not an ally. We were an associated power. We were fought with, alongside them, but we did our own thing. The Allies threw their hands up because they didn't want any of those 14 points. They wanted to keep, you know, they wanted revenge and they wanted to grab new territory and they wanted to steal stuff from the Germans and make them pay for it. <laughs> All of this stuff, and so, the Germans, when they read the, the 14 points, they said, oh, good, we the war now. And so the Allies sort of had to go along with it. But in the end, they never agreed to any of the, the 14 points, except for the League of Nations, which they weren't interested in either at all, because that meant giving up authority or, or sovereignty. So anyway, the, uh, the war ends. And you know the date the war ends, don't you? November 11th. The 11th. At the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And we still celebrate Armistice Day, don't we? So we just don't call it Armistice Day anymore because it didn't mean anything after World War II started. So we quickly forgot, even though it says never forget here. Um, we treated it as a victory, but it was not a victory. We're going to treat the people who chose to stop fighting as if they lost the war, but they didn't lose the war. And hence, they're going to create the situations during World War I that are going to create the problems of World War II. What you see on the left is, or the right is the poppy. That even today, the poppy is a, a symbol of remembrance. And just recently, by the way, the uh, British um, uh, delegation was in a trade delegation in China. And they were wearing poppies, and some official there got all upset about the the um, the uh, 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 opium wars where the British and the Chinese fought in the middle of the 19th century. They didn't recognize that it was a World War I remembrance thing. To them, they thought they were being insulted by the British. So the poppy of remembrance. All right, here's the basic cost of the war as basically generalized. Nine million mil military deaths, five million civilian deaths, seven million men permanently disabled, $186 billion, and that's when dollars really were dollars. Uh, in total and direct costs, one, 151 billion in indirect costs, the collapse of four great empires, which are, is going to mess up the world system. Um, Russia, which is, we'll see in just a minute, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Two of those are, have major consequences, um, especially Russia and the Ottoman Empire, which we don't pay much attention to, but the long-term effect is going to be very serious. And even one that's a little bit harder to nail down is that people generally believe the world was getting better. And they generally believe that progress, we're living in a progressive time with new technology and 
new ideas. And when World War I did that, it just snuffed that idea right out because the war was so horrible that you couldn't believe in progress anymore. There was so much death, so much violence. So many young men died in, in Europe, for instance. They called that the lost generation. There were, whole, there were thousands and hundreds of thousands of women who never married because of all the young men who died. And it was a shock to these places where there never had been anything like this before. Uh, massive million, uh, millions of people who died. All right, first thing in the middle of the war, or towards the end of the war, the Russian Revolution in 1917. Originally overthrew the Tsar, and then uh, by October of 1917, a second revolution took place that we call this the Bolshevik or the Communist Revolution, led by Lenin. The Germans had actually allowed Lenin to sneak into Russia coming from Switzerland in a car that they allowed to cross their territory because they wanted him. He promised to end the war. And that's what he did. After they overthrew the Republican government, they basically surrendered and gave away a whole bunch of their territory to the Germans. But they had the end of the war. So what happened then was that the Russians uh, had a civil war that went on until the early 20s. And out of this came communist, the Communist Soviet Union. And of course, after Lenin died in 1923, um, his, this one deputy that he warned everybody about became the great leader, Stalin, one of the worst dictators of all time, uh, comparable to Hitler. We, we often don't remember what Stalin did because he was our ally in World War II. But he killed his share of people as well, maybe even more. Um, he established not just the Soviet Union, but a whole worldwide network of communist parties that were dedicated to expanding communism. The Comintern International, as it, as it was called. And it was to basically turn labor movements into potential socialist or communist movements as well. And so, again, how this came about would not have happened when it did without World War I. Now, what did communism cost? This was an estimate that somebody did a few years ago. 65 million people died in the Republic of China, basically. People's Republic of China, 20 million in the Soviet Union, 2 million in Cambodia, 2 million in North Korea, 1.7. You can read the rest. It's a butcher's bill of about 94 million people dying because of the uh, creation of communism as a, as a political system and social system. Um, so it is, it is a, basically, it speaks its own uh, horrible language here for us. Now, of course, you can't talk about the war unless you talk about how the war ended. And remember, the war ended with nobody's a victor, but the, the allies and the president of the United States all met at the Versailles, of the Palace of Versailles outside of Paris. That's President Wilson in the center with the top hat on. That's Georges Clemenceau raising his uh, hat in a, the French premier on the left, and that's David Lloyd George, the British prime minister, on the right. What they leave out of the picture is the prime minister of Italy. They, they, both, all of these three considered him a loser, so he never gets in any of the good pictures. And he's insisting that he wants a piece of the, the Italians fought this war to get land from Austria. That's what they're there for. So the peace conference, this is probably the most important peace conference probably in modern history because of all the mistakes they make. Uh, the war, first of all, as you know, is blamed on Germany. Now the Germans were one of all those countries that went to war for, for defensive reasons. Can there be a legitimate argument that Germany caused the war not really. It wasn't their leader that was assassinated, but they did give Austria-Hungary a blank check to attack Serbia after the Austria-Hungary's um, uh, the Fred, Arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serbian terrorist. They wouldn't have acted on that if the Germans hadn't told them that they could. But did Germany create the war? No. Uh, Germany was so successful at it that the Allies felt that they had to make Germany be punished at the end of the war. And, but Germany, when, they, when the war ended, they were still in France and Belgium. They were, they were not having the chase back to their own territory. They were still in a forward position. They believed that they had won. And it would be hard to argue with them that they hadn't at the time. Out of this, they were saddled with war reparations, which is something the 14 points doesn't allow for. That means you're going to have to pay for the war. You're going to pay for all the money and treasure that we spend on this war. And of course, Germany doesn't have money and treasure to pay for this. They don't have the colonial system because they took away their colonies. And they lost territories in the, in the west to France. They lost a big chunk of their territory in Poland, a new country that was created at the peace conference after the war. Poland did not exist before this uh, for a couple hundred years. The 
they had to send, surrender their gigantic battle fleet, uh, which had only fought one battle and had not really been defeated. They were forbidden to have an air force. So in a modern world, they don't have the status symbol of having the huge fleet. And second of all, they can't have an air force, which is the new, the new power source. So, and anyway, Western Germany would be occupied by France until they paid their, their war reparations, which they weren't able to do. And uh, the Kaiser was forced to abdicate, and he moved to Holland and became a farmer. Long enough to live, by the way, until the German troops showed up in Holland in 1940. He was there, and when they came in, he greeted them. They said hi. So, different, different Germany at that time. German resentment, you can see here that the, the German cartoon showing that there being uh, Wilson on the left and, and the, the other people there are going to execute the German, uh, cut off his head basically to, to, uh, to punish him for the war. Um, they also believed, since they couldn't figure out why they were being treated as they lost, maybe they lost because Jews had stabbed them in the back. And the anti-Semitism, which was part of all European countries, was not any stronger in Germany than it was in France, much stronger in France, by the way, but France didn't lose this war, and so the Germans looked for a scapegoat to explain how they could have lost. The other one, of course, you see in the picture at the lower right, there's a character that you might recognize on the far right. That's Adolf Hitler, right here. And he was a soldier in World War I, and he was frustrated by the treatment of Germany after the war, and he would use that frustration to build his Nazi organization in the early 1920s. Here's an interesting thing. Here's Asia. We don't think about Asia much in the European War, but Japan had been an ally of the British since 1902, and they had cooperated with occupying German islands during the Pacific, in the Pacific during the war, and they also occupied a German territory in China. And one of the things that they wanted out of all this is they wanted the elite, the, the peace conference, to give a statement of racial equality. And you see, I've highlighted the, the key things. As soon as possible to all alien nationals of states, members of the leagues, equal and just treatment in every respect, making no distinction either in law or fact on account of race or nationality. President Wilson was chairing the conference when this came out, and he said, well, this has to be a unanimous agreement on this. That is a setup, actually, because the Australia was, was had a, their policy was called white Australia. They were totally against all Asians. And Australia persuaded Britain to veto it. British, if they meant equality, they might have to give up their Indian Empire. So the Japanese were insulted. They were slapped in the face, basically, on what we would think is a very reasonable request, racial equality. But the people at the time, the United States didn't have racial equality. Britain didn't have racial equality. No colonial power had racial equality. The Japanese wanted simply the statement that they were equal to everybody else. They're not going to go away. They're going to come back in about 20 some odd years. And it's called World War II because of this. And so they were insulted and they walked out. Okay, also, we had a character named Nguyen Ai Kwok who also showed up, which means Nguyen the Smart. That was a nickname his father gave him. And he also came and said, we talk about the Vietnamese people who are part of French Indochina. And he was ignored by everybody at the conference. So he'll come back later, too. The Chinese were also upset. They wanted the, the German part of China to be handed back to China. They had just established a Republican government, and they wanted it. But instead, the League gave it to Japan. And this created a strong resentment in China towards the West, and which is what we call the May 4th movement. Very strong uh, riots and so on out of this. They're going to be disappointed, because clearly the victors are not including Asians. China was one of the few countries that did not ratify it. They were ratified the peace treaty because of this. They walked out also. Now, the most direct result is one that's still with us every single day, and that's the Middle East. Because the League, because World War I, the, Vic, the, the, the Allies and the League of Nations afterwards screwed everything up. That's the best way to describe it. And we're still living with this today, all the way to the events that have happened this very day, including ISIS. First of all, one of the most horrible events ever in human history occurred during the war. The, the Russians were one of the allies, and they were fighting against the Ottoman Empire, which had many different Christian nationalities in their empire. And they considered that the Armenians were allies of the Russians. And so even today, the Turkish government refuses to acknowledge that there was, they, they tried to massacre the Armenians, but the fact was 1.5 million Armenians were killed. 
And not only just um, Armenians tell us this story, but nurses, people that were nurses, even Germans that were there, oh, hello, even Germans that were there took pictures and made note of the fact that the massacre was going on. And uh, they were forced uh, to leave their homes, marched under, um, under Turkish soldiers who had no sympathy for them, not unlike the Bataan Death March in World War II. There was rape, there was murder, uh, torture, they died of exposure, and their bodies were left out. And just This is one of the nicer pictures I could find. Now, there's a, there is a decapitation picture coming up next. So. Um, Hitler, this is Hitler's quote about the, the later on. Who remembers the Armenian genocide? That because the, nobody did anything about the genocide, Hitler could maybe think later about maybe killing off the Jews and since nobody did anything about the Armenians. And so he remembered it. Germans knew about it, but nobody had done anything about it. Then there's all of the, the shenanigans of the Allies during the war. And so the, the British government talked to the Sharif of the Hejaz, which is the person who's in charge of the holy cities, and tried to get him to revolt against the Ottoman Turks. And so they had these agreements called the McMahon Agreements. And what they told the Arabs were, if you join the war against the Ottomans, you can have your own territory. And, and of course, it's going to be the non-Turkish areas of the Ottoman Empire, which of course includes all of Syria, all of uh, what's now Jordan and Palestine and Iraq and and uh, Kuwait and so on, Yemen and Arabia. They were promised that would be their territory. Did they follow up on this? Not really, but they promised the Arabs that they would be able to have their own lands. At the same time, they were negotiating with the French and the Russians. Let's divide up the, the Ottoman Empire between us and we'll get what we want. And this is called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The territory in blue is going to be under direct French control. And what they were most interested in is this area right here, which is today the modern state of Lebanon. There, the French had been the, the, the traditional protectors of the Maronite Christians there during the Ottoman Empire, something called the millet system. And they, they, they had wanted to continue to protect them. They also wanted to take this southern part of Turkey here, which they did not get, but they wanted it. Uh, they wanted this area, which we now call Syria. This is where all of the events are going on right now. The British said that this would be an international area, but they're going to administer it. That's, of course, Jerusalem and Palestine. And then we have what became Transjordan, what became Iraq, what became Kuwait, all of these areas here. The British would control the territories that they wanted. And that they allowed the French, who didn't do any fighting in the region, to have the territories that they wanted. The Russians, by meanwhile, dropped out of the war because of the Russian Revolution, and they published all of this stuff embarrassing the Allies in the middle of the war, causing President Wilson to, I guess, have a colorful expletive about how you can't trust the Allies. So while they're talking to the Arabs, while they're making their own plans to divide things after the war, they promise the Jews that they can have a homeland in Palestine. This is still the British, by the way. As you see, we now have overlapping promises. You can see where this is going, of course. The Balfour Declaration. Arthur Balfour, who was the Secretary of State, or uh, Secretary of State for the British government. Out of this, of course, at the end of the war, when they took over the territories, instead of giving them to the peoples that they had promised, they actually then uh, established the mandates. They get to hang on to these territories as if they were one of their colonies with the purpose of training people, and put that in quotes, so that they could be able to run their own country later on. And so what do we get? The British get Palestine and keep the, kick the French out. They don't get any chance going to Palestine. The French get Lebanon. They also get Syria. The British create the leftover parts here, Iraq and Transjordan. The British put monarchs in the territories that they control. There still is a king of Jordan today, a descendant of one of the Hashemites that had fought for them during the war. There was his, his brother was the king of Iraq, but he was overthrown by Saddam back in the early uh, 70s, I believe by the Ba'ath Party. Uh, the French didn't even pr pretend to give the Arabs anything. They just said, get out, we're running everything. Now, what you see here are countries that are created by European powers. There's no basis for these countries to exist. They're just lines drawn in the, la in the land. There's, there's no separate Syrian people. There's no Jordanians. There's no Iraqis. They are all Muslim, Arab Muslim people and other minorities. They're not divided up by nationality. They're just Europeans decided, I get this part, you get this part, you get this part, I get that part. 
these countries have no reason for existence. Of course, Palestine, out of this problem with promising uh, the, the territory to Arabs and to the Jews, you have what's happened since 1948, which is the state of Israel is established, and, and then uh, the territory that was non-Jewish Palestine has just, is basically disappearing. So if you're Palestinian, you wonder why people fight for their territory, or they're upset about their losingness. They're losing territory every single election, it seems like, and so it continues. ISIS. What is ISIS doing? Well, they're totally against the creation of these secular states that have nothing to do with the people there. They want to create an Islamic state, which is what the Ottoman Empire was officially. And so ISIS, of course, stands for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. But according to them, there is no Iraq and Syria. So can you see why they are trying to do what they're trying to do? They're also trying to get us to, to react. They want to try to create what they think is going to be Armageddon by getting the West. That's why they're trying to shock us all the time. But the thing is that we didn't create the problem of, of the Middle East. The, the, United, the League of Nations did at the behest of the British and the French. But the problem continues. It's never stopped. And it's not going to stop until people really turn things around. We can bomb ISIS all they want, but they're not going to stop because what we want them to do, which is recognize these secular states, has nothing to do with what they believe or what they value or any of that stuff. There will always be somebody who will be resisting this. So, unfortunately, I wish there was a quick and easy answer, but there isn't. Now, switching gears to the Great Depression. It's, it's kind of a stretch to link the Great Depression to World War I. But after the war, remember, the Allies are forcing the Germans to pay reparations. The Germans don't have any money, so what do they do? They borrow from American banks. And the, the Europeans' economy, which is hurting because of the war, they want us to, to sort of forgive their loans. And we don't, especially when, as the Depression goes along, we refuse to, um, to, to do this. And they call us not Uncle Sam, but Uncle Shylock, because we refuse to actually get, let their loans go and, and let the, basically let them off scot-free. By the way, only one country paid off its loans from World War I to us, and that was, I believe, Finland. So the rest have never done that. They, they all defaulted because they were never able to pay them. Think about the Germans. They borrowed from us to pay the Allies so they could pay us. And so the, you know, that's the reason why the German economy collapsed before ours did in the Great Depression. But this international monetary system was very weak. And was, this was one of the reasons why after the war, World War II, we created a, an economic system at Breton, Breton Woods that's based on the US dollar rather than the British pound during this period. Well, of course, another thing is the rise of fascism coming directly out of World War II. Mussolini was a socialist uh, journalist who had, been a, who had agitated against uh, Italy during the war, and then when Italy did not get Trieste and all the territories it wanted, he basically said, you, you've been fooled, marched on Rome with his supporters, and they overthrew the government. This is just a few years after the end of World War I. And he set up the fascist salute and the, the brown shirts. He had the black shirts, and Hitler would have the brown shirts and so on. Hitler would copy him in his rise to power. And they were allies during World War II. And of course, we also don't forget that Franco in Spain and all the horrible things that happened in the Spanish Civil War in the 30s also was an emulator. And he lasted until the 70s. So if you were Spanish, you would still be all mad at it. The fascism only came out of the crisis of World War I. Now, as these dictators got more and more powerful and Hitler began demanding, as he came to power, more and more uh, uh, changes to the, the system after Versailles, Britain and France, the two great um, leaders in the Western Europe, they were not prepared to fight. So they, they had a policy that we call, that was called appeasement. And we, we congratulated them. President Roosevelt sent letters of congratulations to the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who you see right here in the lower right, waving his piece of paper, saying that Hitler is going to not take any more of, of Czechoslovakia, which he promptly did a few months later. But uh, we were all happy. We, nobody wanted to go to war. The United States had set up neutrality laws during the 30s so that we could never be dragged into another war again. You know how well that worked, right? So here we have, this is a great little cartoon that, oh, I'm sorry, that shows Hitler dancing on the backs of, of the democracies, basically, because they're bending over backwards for him and letting him step over them. One of the results of this is that after World War II, the United States doesn't want to appease anybody. Although John McCain is claiming that we're appeasing Russia right now. So he's entitled to his belief. Now, what about the Japanese? Remember, they were insulted. Let's come back to the Japanese. 
They were at the Washington Naval Conference in 1921 when both Britain and the United States wanted to stop spending money on battleships. They said, you can, for every five battleships the British have, the Americans can have five, but the, but the Japanese can only have three. That means you're like the three-fifths clause in the Constitution. You're only three-fifths of a person. You're not a real power like us because you're Asian. Japanese were tremendously insulted by that. Then in 1930, the US, in, the, in another naval conference in Washington, to, or in um, London, we, we told the British, you can have an agreement with us on cruisers, but you have to break your treaty with Japan. So the Japanese were even further insulted by that. Because you know, the United States was thinking, we might have to fight a war with Japan someday. And so what happened then was, the timing is critical. The next year, Japan's invading China. The next year, because they don't have the British to restrain them. And they, that actually, you might call the attack in 31, the, 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 uh, that's really the beginning of World War II. We don't count it generally, but it is when you think about it. It's the Japanese taking of Manchuria, which became one, their, their, their puppet state of Manchukuo, which they took the last Chinese emperor and made him the leader of. Then in 1938, they, the famous incident at the, um, the, ba the bridge in Beijing, and then they started to attack uh, China, to capture all of China. And, during, and that, that's really nonstop fighting till the end of the war because of that. Uh, because they were on the outs now between the, uh, the British and the United States was trying to stop them, they could look around at who was looking for an ally, but the, the two um, uh, fascist powers of Italy and Germany, which had started already World War II, it started in, in uh, France, or and, and in uh, Poland, excuse me, in 1939. And so they joined, and that's a, it's, a, it's an alliance to both contain the Soviet Union, the anti comintern Pact, is to suggest to the Russians, don't fight because the Japanese will attack you on the other side. Now, should the Russians have been afraid of the Japanese? Yes, the Japanese had defeated them in 1905, totally humiliated them. And the, the Russians were very wary of the Japanese. We tended to look down upon them for racial, racial reasons here. Uh, this is a pretty horrible picture, I'm sorry, but this is, uh, shows you what the Japanese did when they got to Nanjing, which was one of the regional uh, capitals. It was, the, I think it was the capital of the Republic of China at the time. And between 42 to 200,000 people uh, killed. The Japanese took pictures of themselves uh, beheading people. They had a contest to see who was good at it. Um, they killed children. Um, there's nothing good about this whatsoever. An American author a few years ago wrote the classic book on it, and she was Chinese-American, and she was so shocked by what she found that she actually killed herself. Just from all the shocking truths that we tend to ignore because this happened in China, so it isn't real. But yes, it was real and horrible. And it was part of the World War II in Asia that we tend to forget. World War II continued. Some historians call World War I and World War II actually one war, calling it the 50-year war. And uh, here we see German troops marching into Paris, the one thing they couldn't do in World War I. They did it in a few months in World War II. And we have Japanese troops there on the right. So it was a, two different wars, actually. We call it World War II. The Japanese call their war the Pacific War, still, in their descriptions of it. This was not a great war anymore. The Great War was the first one, and now it had been forgotten. It was just called World War I, and people stopped remembering it for that reason. I bring up Pearl Harbor because Americans, when we think of World War II, this is what happened. And also in honor of my uncle who died just in August, right before the semester started last semester, he had been at Pearl Harbor. And it was very important to him. He was 98 years old when he died. And his ship was right there. Pardon me. That's the Neosho, which is a tanker right behind the flagship, which is the California. And it was one of two ships that actually got underway during the battle and got out of Pearl Harbor. But um, Obviously, why did the Japanese attack us? Uh, we were the only threat to them and their plans to expand in the Pacific area and continue the war in China and go for the resources in Southeast Asia. The United States before the war, which my uncle was involved in this, used to ship uh, scrap metal and uh, oil from California, from Long Beach, to uh, Honolulu, to Yokohama. It was a regular thing that we sent them. And of course, all that stuff's going to come back to us at Pearl Harbor, all that scrap iron. So, but this is again, his life changed and people who live, who were here, their lives changed and a whole generation of Americans changed because of Pearl Harbor. Again, it would not have happened if we had not dissed Japan as badly as we did in the era right after World War I. 
uh, the Holocaust. I need I say more. I mean, this is so horrible that there's really no, no uh, con a context for this. But remember, the Holocaust, we only remember because we want to remember. We forget a lot of the people who died in Russia during World War II as well. And there's, there are much greater numbers died in Russia. The costs of World War II, 35 to 60 million dead. Again, an estimate, because only the United States and Britain kept act accurate records. Some of the others, we have no idea. They're still finding bodies. And well over a trillion in costs. And uh, basically, it was a lot worse than World War I. But World War I, in terms of its context, was the first great horrible war. And this was just the next great horrible war after that. So, um, And again, it transformed the United States from being a disinterested country to being a world power that really would never stop being a world power since 1945. So again, it affects all of you. Of course, we have the atomic age, which we don't like to think about. But we're still the only country that's used atomic weapons. And um, you know, the historians sometimes say, why should we do it? But at the time, people thought it was a necessary thing to do. And especially since the United States has spent millions of dollars developing the bomb. And if they hadn't used it and a lot of people had died invading Japan, we never would have heard the end of that one. So President Truman authorized the, the bombing. And the war did end, but it didn't end because of the atomic bombings. It ended because the Russians entered the war the next day against Japan. And the Japanese were, had seen what the Russians did to Germany. So the atomic bomb did not have the deterrent effect that we often think it did. But it wouldn't influence the rest of the century. This is 1949 when the Russians finally exploded their atomic bomb. And we suddenly went into full panic mode during the Cold War era. The Pentagon shows excitement, but officials mum. Isn't that appropriate? The period after World War II, up to roughly 1991, again, uh, uh, the long-term effects of, of the World War I, we have the Cold War between the communist world and the capitalist world. And again, remember, communism is a direct result of World War I. And so all of the things that went on during this time, an arms race, so much so that by the time we got to uh, the 1990s, there was enough atomic weapons to kill everybody in the world 13 times. I mean, what's the purpose of that? There isn't any purpose. Everybody's dead. But enough weapons. Eventually, they started to reduce the number of weapons, but they still had plenty to kill everybody more than once. So um, that also, the, every little conflict in the world became an east-west confrontation. There was uh, massive military spending over instead of spending things for people, they spent things on the military because you can't be soft on communism. Or I guess if you're communist, you can't be soft on capitalism. But it became a way to, to justify keeping that military-industrial uh, complex that President Eisenhower worried about in the 1950s, 1960. Um, we also gave up a lot of our freedoms in the name of safety. We gave up the right, for instance, the freedom of speech, the freedom of association. It was actually, a law was passed making it illegal to join a, the Communist Party. But that's a freedom of speech, when to join a, and have a political opinion. But people were so afraid it became a crime. Um, suspicion and spying, red baiting, fear mongering. Every school teacher in, in the country, or at least in California, has, has to sign a loyalty oath that they're not teaching their students to overthrow the government. It's still there. It's still a requirement. It's still an insult, as far as I'm concerned. But it was part of this whole Cold War process. Again, tons and tons of money being spent on that. The Korean War, communism. Korea, we're still making that connection back to World War I. Both Communist China, which became, went communist in 1949 because uh, they were so mad at the West that they that Mao had, had switched over to the, get help from the Russians after the Russian Revolution. Takes over China in 1949. The Korean War starts the immediate next year because the US had sent signals we would not defend Korea. But the war has never ended. It ended with an armistice, 1953, I believe. And it has never ended. If there's still both sides glaring at each other, and now Korea has weapons of mass destruction. So we aren't just going to bop them over the head. We have to be very careful how we treat them. And they're still crazy. Yeah. I, I show this because my father, who's in the audience, would serve in the Korean War. He would not have been in the Korean War, or had not been in the circumstances of his life, because, um, because again, you had to serve when you did that. Was the, what you did at the time, and he was aboard the USS Iowa which is, by the way, now docked down in Long Beach. You should go down and see what a real battleship looks like. We don't make battleships anymore. 
But uh, the Iowa, he was on the Iowa and they cruised off the coast of North Korea lobbing shells at him. So, from miles and miles away. But it's an experience. So. Uh, now, we have Nguyen the, the Smart becomes Ho Chi Minh. Remember, he had showed up at the peace conference asking for consideration of Vietnam and French Indochina and everybody said nobody listened to him. So he went back to Paris and helped found the French Communist Party in 1920. He went on then to school in Moscow. He learned all about communism. He then went to, um, to Indochina. He went to, actually went to China under, when it was under uh, Chiang Kai-shek and they put him in jail because they were anti-communist. And then when World War II came along, he and his uh, communist forces fought against the, the Japanese occupation of, the, of French Indochina, cooperated with the United States. There were OSS, which was before the CIA. They, they were going in there and meeting with him and, and sending supplies and stuff like that. And um, they, the French were finally defeated in 1954. Dien Bien Phu, the, the French uh, forces were forced to leave. There was a famous peace conference in 1954 in May. I was just one month old at the time. And they, the United States and everybody agreed that we would allow have free elections in Vietnam. And then when it looked like Ho Chi Minh would win, we canceled those elections. So this is where we stepped in, in our fight against communism, and we helped create the Vietnam War, which followed. We set up a puppet government in South, South, um, South Vietnam that basically did what we wanted it to do. And um, they immediately started in 1959. They started uh, uh, the Viet Cong, which was a com South Vietnamese communist, started attacking the government there. The U.S. got drawn in by 1964, more landing troops there. Many people here perhaps may have served in Vietnam. And again, the, the World War I's evil tendrils come along to touch your life or maybe the lives of people that you know. Porterville, as you know, lost more people per capita in the Vietnam War than any other city in the country um, based on the size of our town, which is why we were one of the very first to have a Vietnam Memorial for people who honorably served and gave their life, again, for the, the business of the United States, but perhaps if we had been thinking about, we did some of these things, we might have not have gone down this road. But we did the road that we did. The communism eventually collapsed, and everybody, this was 1989, 1991. Um, communism was you know, basically when the Russians ran out of leaders who were, were, had lived through the Russian Revolution and World War II, they fell apart. It wasn't anything we did, they collapsed on their own. Uh, we happened to be there, and people said we won and they lost. And so we have continued to use that, that if we just disable them, we, they will fall apart. We keep trying to disable Fidel Castro. You can see how long that's lasted. Since 1959, he's still around. Same age as my father. So he's 88 years old, and he's still around. Uh, he's lasted through something like 13 presidencies. And uh, we also want, now we want, we're worried about China and what China's trying to do. Well, you know, rather than try to accommodate and find a way to work with China, we, it doesn't do to demonize them. But we, we are now, we, we're in our Cold War mode. We've got to demonize somebody. So we fail to understand what's going on. We fail to remember our history, which is something that I hope that you will learn from all of this, is that history does have a way of fighting us back. Uh, now, if you think that was bad, it's not over yet. We're getting there, though. Only a few more minutes left. The countries that multinational states that were put together at the end of World War I, like Czechoslovakia, it fell apart in the 1990s, the fall of communism. Communism had kept it together. And Yugoslavia fell apart. Now, the Czech Republic and, and uh, Slovakia came apart peacefully. They are they, they relatively uh, well behaved towards each other. But Yugoslavia fell apart into what we call ethnic cleansing. Horrors. The Serbians massacred uh, people. The Croats managed to get out. The Croats were, who were Catholic or fighting the Serbians, who are Orthodox Christians, who are fighting the Bosnians, who are Muslims. They're all in the same country, and they created separate countries. Here is an example of the Bosnian genocide, where people were just killed because they were of a different religion. And again, there's you think people would have learned by the 1990s. This is the countries that were put together at the end of World War I at the peace conference, and they fell apart in the 90s. So again, World War I is still ticking away. Uh, then the Kosovo War. I'm not going to say any more about this. It's the same sort of thing. Kosovo is in the Balkans, too. And again, the Serbians were involved. And this time we used NATO to fight against the Serbians, and we lost a few men there as well. 
So what's still going on from World War I? Israel-Palestine. There's no solution to that anytime soon. Um, continuation of the Western secular states is a, is a dream. It's not going to happen. We'll never be able to reconstruct those states. Korean War is still totally unresolved. Uh, China-Taiwan is another issue. Taiwan is the Republic of China, which is not communist, and then the People's Republic on the mainland. We say there's one China, but guess what? There's really two. And how that's going to be resolved, nobody knows that one either. The Russian rise, the Russians are tired of being stepped on, all that triumphalism after the end of the Cold War. Putin, who's a former C uh, head of the, um, the Russian Secret Service and so on, is um, now in charge, has been in charge for years, and he wants to, Russia to be respected and, and feared again. And so we have people saying that we need to stand up to it. Well, I'm not sure that's necessarily the best thing to do right now. Fear mongering with China continues. We still demonize people that are different from we, that we, than we are. We don't see them, that they might actually have some legitimate claims. Uh, doesn't mean that we give up our values, but we need to uh, try to understand the other side as much as possible. And we still have very little faith in the future. I mean, it's, it hasn't gone away, it hasn't gotten any better, has it? I don't mean to end this on a, down, a downer, but it is what it is. Um, in the balance, though, we, we tend to forget, we, we often go to war thinking that war will solve problems. It often creates a whole host of other problems that we, we don't tend to think about long term. Uh, but we do need to start thinking long term. That's what historians supposedly claim that they can do is give you that long term perspective. Maybe, maybe not. It's up for you to learn and up to you to decide, you know, as, as active citizens to decide what it is you want to do. But maybe someday we'll learn. We'll have to see. I'm, I'm sort of positive on this, that, that I have some positive values on this, so I hope you do too. Anyway, sorry this has been such a downer, but World War I was a gigantic mess. And there, you know, this is not to say that there weren't valuable things that came out of World War I, but this is just to talk about the evil things that came out of the war and that are still with us. So does anybody have any questions? Or comments. Yes. So, when you're trying to say that uh, everything that's going on now is still reflected on World War One. Well, it either came from the war, the the, the countries that were set up as enemies during the war, and how they were treated after the war. So people, countries never forgot what happened. Well, partly, it's just simply they morphed into new conflicts. I mean, with the, with the, with Russia going out of the war, but then communist Russia coming in. The entire story of communism versus the, the capitalist West has never really ended. It's still going on. China, go over to Walmart, buy something at Walmart, you're making communist China very happy. So I'm not saying boycott Walmart. I'm not saying because Walmart's going to jump out of the parking lot and grab me. Actually. But it's just, there are actual, I mean, it's like being a relative. It's this, these connections continue. They, 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 they change, but they still go back to these decisions that were made over 100, almost 100 years ago now. Walmart is a result of World War II? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get an A for that. Yes, okay. Has World War I had any effect on Africa itself? Well, in, in Africa, the European countries had established their colonies, and they had divided up Africa at the Berlin Conference in the 1880s. During the war, uh, the British and German colonies fought against each other in Africa. At the end of the war, remember, Germany lost everything, so the British took over most of their colonies. And for instance, like uh, southwestern Africa, which had become Namibia, that was a Ger that was German southwestern Africa, and the other one was uh, oh, it's now Tanzania, it was German East Africa. And eventually, though those those areas, the Germans had been a horrible coloni colonizers. They had treated their natives worse than anybody but the Belgians, who were really bad. But uh, Africa, there was fighting uh, in World War One. There was not any fighting there in World War Two. The fighting in World War Two was all in North Africa. Modern-day Africa is, again, divided by colonizers who drew the lines between, the, right down the middle of tribes. We get this part, you get that part. And so many of the country boundaries in Africa make no sense either. You know, and the people there are very frustrated because they had no say in any of this stuff. So this is what's happening in the Middle East. The, 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 the decisions made by Europeans a hundred, almost 100 years ago are coming home to roost right now. Okay, you had your hand up? Here, yes. Would you discuss the differences between communism and fascism and their progression in Russia and in Germany? Or, yeah. Well, in many ways, they, they look similar. The 
if you were up close. And both of them were what we call totalitarian, which means they controlled all aspects of people's lives. Um, communism said that it was the workers' paradise, that they're going to provide everything for everybody. But uh, as socialism said it would do, but what communists had was a small group of people, the Central Committee, that ran, made all the decisions for everybody else. In uh, fascist Germany or Italy, it was the leader who made all the decisions. Now, it, there's always in theory and there's practice. Stalin wound up making all the important decisions. Mao made all the important decisions. Um, they didn't tolerate rivals at any time. They used uh, terror. Both of them did. They're just, fascism would be of the right and communism would be of the left. Okay, it would be backwards for you guys, of the left and of the right. But there's actually very similar, there's strong similarities in what the, as you would have observed them on the ground. They would have seemed very similar. Which is the reason why Stalin and Hitler were actually uh, somewhat allies at the beginning of World War II, although Hitler had promised that he was going to attack Soviet Russia in his book, Mein Kampf. To be able to start the war and invade Poland, the, 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 the Germans had actually, when they had rebuilt their military, they had built it in Russia. The Russians had allowed them to come in. Uh, during the interwar period and build their military up there. And secretly, because the Russians were blocked off all access because they, the Soviet Union was very secretive. And they, the Germans pay, paid them a whole lot of money to be able to do that. But then the Germans would turn on the Russians and attack them in 19, for, June 1941. And that was their biggest mistake of the war, was attacking the Soviet Union. Because it's the Russians who really defeated the Germans in World War II. We played a part. The British played a part, but the, the Russians, when we landed at Normandy, we faced two German divisions. What was going on in Russia? 100, 300 uh, German divisions were fighting against the Russians. I mean, that's the difference. We, we remember our part, but our part was very small potatoes compared to what the Russians were doing. They're the ones who really defeated the Nazis. We played a part. We gave them, we sold supplies, to, we gave supplies to them and supported them, and um, which is why they war determined that they were going to they weren't going to be attacked again they were going to take as much of eastern europe as they wanted and we agreed with that basically at the yalta conference in, in russia in, in april or february 1945 so if, if, with the promise that they would enter the war against japan you join us in the war against japan and we'll let you hold on to eastern europe kind of a devil's bargain unfortunately then we had the whole Cold War trying to free Eastern Europe, basically, at least talking about it. But in the end, the people of Eastern Europe freed themselves, if you remember the early 90s. Yes, way in the back. I was in the South America tended to stay out of every conflict so far. Um, South America was of no interest to anybody. The Germans actually had agents in South America during World War II. Uh, many of the coffee plantations in, in uh, Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador were owned by Germans. And what happened was the FBI got in touch with the local governments there and basically came out and just arrested them and put them in concentration camps. They also, we also did that, you know, we know about locking up our Japanese citizens, the Japanese American citizens here. We also persuaded the government of Peru to, to lock up all of its Japanese citizens and ship them to the United States during the war. And they were, they basically did, um, agricultural labor in South Texas during most of the war. But the, the, and then after the war, by the way, Peru didn't want it back. They, and they, they, they couldn't go to Japan, and they couldn't go back to Peru. So what, they were, they were like non-people. So they, they were enemy aliens, and so they couldn't stay here either. So they were really screwed, unfortunately. They were sort of stuck in the middle. We treated Japanese Americans and Japanese Peruvians really badly. Germans weren't treated so badly. We didn't have German prisoners, by the way, in this area over by the airport during the war. You guys know about that, right? <laughs> so who knows? There might be somebody's descendants here. So. Other questions? Yes? Um, do you think that there is any possibility of a peaceful resolution to Israel and Palestine? Really? Thank the British for this. They promised it to everybody. But they had no intention of giving it to anybody either. Yeah. Um, if the Palestinians stop insisting on a state on statehood, that'll, that'll work. Or if Israel decides to give back land from the 67 war, none of these things are going to happen. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I wish they were, but as the Germans say, that's cloud cuckoo land. It's just not going to happen. And, and I wish it would, honestly. I mean, really, the Middle East is terribly depressing. I'd like to personally get 
the, the leaders from both both countries lock them in a room and say, figure it out. And people have done that. There's actually it's, there's something on the Food Channel that does that. If I saw they actually did you see an advertisement? They're, they're eating together. Is it now? What do you want for peace? It's like they, as if they could solve it. The problem is. We're enabling the Israelis too. Remember, the president of Israel was in the prime minister of Israel was in Washington, getting standing ovations for people who weren't who aren't members of Congress, uh, because he's trying to influence us, and people here are, are trying to to influence that too. So, the United States was a, a part of the beginning of this, but we are part of the continuation of it. We we have taken over as the great power in the Middle East. And it's a lose, lose, lose. Everybody hates us. The Israelis say they like us. They're lying. I don't. I don't know if they're lying, but it's. It's. We're disappointing them all the time because we're trying to be even-handed, and it's almost impossible to be even-handed. I wish. I wish I had a solution. If I did, I would. You know, be king of the forest. So I'm not, unfortunately. But you know, it doesn't mean that you guys can't think of these and then communicate with people. Yeah. Do you think that the, um, the Arabs really don't like, or really, really feel about this? First of all, we can't give land back to because it's not our well, land. The and if we tried to force Israel, Israel would resist. They would resist. Uh, their own well, government, their own government, cannot persuade people to give up land. I didn't mean that Israel gave up their land because they really didn't care because they lived with Israelis for a long time. But if if the Sykes people, what they were promised when well, what they, 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 they were promised when the when the McMahon Agreement. Yeah, when they fought the Ottoman Empire. Which I'm trying to remember what they yeah. Were And as did the Balfour Declaration. If, if as well. they were given that, do you think that it would make a difference now, or do you want the caliphate and it's not going to make a difference? Uh, you know, the, the the story of ISIS is even more complex it's because of because of Al Qaeda. It's because of it's because we enabled the Shia government to take over after we got rid of Saddam, and the Shia immediately began persecuting the Sunnis. And so ISIS is a Sunni organization. There's there. The, the Iraqi government is like freaking out because they're, you know, they're, they're, or many of them are freaking out because they're bringing Iran in, which is a Shia country, to fight against ISIS. We don't want Iran in there either. The enemy of our enemy is our friend. So it's like it's getting it's like the tar baby. The more you struggle, the worse it gets. So. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in miracles? I don't know. I, I hate to be depressing about this, but I, honestly, I really don't know. Let's have one more question. Yes, down here. Afghanistan has been at war since its existence, it, it seems like. Um, and um, the fact that I don't know whether the ISIS is Sunni or not, they claim to be. The Sunnis haven't accepted them, uh, which is why Iran doesn't want to get involved. Um, but they claim to be. But you got to understand, they have American tanks and guns. People are confused because Al-Qaeda didn't have that kind of infantry. So they see them as an enemy just originally against each other. It's only when you have competing claims and, and we have extremists on the Shia side and extremists now on the Sunni side and where there was no conflict before. They, they, and in fact, here in this country, there is no conflict between the Shia and the Sunni in the United States or any of the other Western countries. But out there, where they're in direct conflict for who's going to run the country. And the thing is that, that Israel really, the, the, the existence of Israel and the, the, it's, its taking over of Palestine has infuriated the entire Muslim world. It isn't just the people in Palestine. It isn't just the people in Syria. Whatever the side they're on in ISIS, so nobody is on Israel's side except for us, apparently. And Panama, I think, is the only one that votes with Israel and the United Nations. Do you think we'll go to war with Iran? And in your opinion, would we seize the oil in the Middle East? I mean, we would go to war to seize oil? No, but we've never entered a war if it wasn't for the interests of our corporations as well. Not to say that that 
Well, I'm not sure that interest of corporations are only the main reason we've gone through. We've gone through a lot of wars in, in, in uh, uh, Central America or complex Central America in, in, in protection of corporate interest. But I would just sort of wrap this up real quickly. The, I think that, um, I, in my personal opinion, I think we need to deal with Iran on a, an adult level. We need to talk to them and treat them like, they want to be treated like the Japanese and the Germans were treated like, we want to be an equal. We want to be treated as an equal, not as a little brown country and you telling us what to do. It's very hard for us to do that. It's very hard for us to do that. If, but if we ever grew up and, did, and treated other countries as equals, it's no guarantee that everything will be better, but it certainly creates a better atmosphere for talking. Okay. Thank you.